Today we're looking at the coolest party trick, the player piano, a piano that plays itself. We'll be going over modern technology and the history of player pianos, specifically the QRS. Hi, this is Ted with Alamo Music Center in downtown San Antonio, Texas. I'm Patrick Moore. You can find us online at alamomusic.com. If you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channels, check out our other videos, sign up for notifications, like our videos, leave us comments. We appreciate your support. We love to interact with you. I guess one of the things we could start off talking about, player pianos. Well, I, it's been putting pianists out of jobs for how many years? Well, I don't know that they ever really went out of work, but what's really interesting is uh, just did a little bit of background research on player pianos, and I came to this thing here, and this, is, this was invented, this concept, like around 1770 in Switzerland. And they were actually the size, no bigger than a pocket watch, okay? And the idea behind it was pretty simple because this is automated music. Mm -hmm. And there's only a selected number of notes. And these things were incredibly popular from around 1810 to 1900. It was the only form of uh, a portable music that you could bring around anywhere. And it's actually automated because it's just a big cylinder with spikes on it that hit the little... It's triggering off tones. the different tones. Right. And there's actually, you can look in there, there's, a, there's like the same thing that you see on a harp, how there's short notes and high notes. And so there's a capo bar and it's, and it's tuned. And what's interesting about that is because what kind of made these things popular is that the small ones invented ones that had a bigger cylinder on them. Mm -hmm. And the problem with a bigger cylinder is that you'd have to have a, a deal. So they came out with, this plays the music, and you can swap the cylinders out. So you had this big thing, and it would crank. Some of them were spring-loaded. Then they went to the circular, like a saw pattern to just hit all, all the deals. And they have a really nice, I've seen some really nice, they look like old turntables are real big. And some of those circular things were up to like two feet wide. Mm -hmm. And just as they were getting super popular, decorated with all kind of fancy wood and wood inlay and everything, well, around that time, it's around the centennial of, uh, of the United States. So it was like 1876. Mm -hmm. And I guess they had an exposition in Philadelphia. They had this kind of combined technologies like the industrial age, what else is available that we have to look forward to. And combined in three different displays, if you took the machinery from here, here, and here, and put it all together, you could theoretically get a player piano. And it took 20 years for them to kind of get around to perfecting that. And part of that perfection involved, there was a player piano that used to go on top. It had mm -hmm. 65 fingers that was manufactured. There's about three or four different manufacturers and, and guys involved with getting the patent on it. And they said they were like wooden fingers that played. And there still is a player system that was big in the 50s that, that you could put over and it would play. The downside to it is that it only played around 60 to 65 notes. And in that 20 year period from 1876 till around the late 1890s, uh, Melville Clark came up with putting all this stuff together. And that's Melville Clark from Story and Clark Piano Manufacturers. And they had kind of put together the whole player system inside one unit and then showed it off. And around that time, other companies were getting ready to bring their, their P, uh, Pianola had one and Pico had one and everyone had their different player systems. And all the guys that invested heavily in the one that went on top with the fingers, they couldn't, they didn't have any money left for reinvestment to get into the interior. When it, when it basically expanded from 65 notes to the entire keyboard, right? Yeah. Uh, and there was, there was many, notes. well, there was manufacturers who were basically relying on the technology to put the 65 note and then sell it as a package deal. And I think I read somewhere that there was, there was cheaper versions, but kind of the, the, the one was about $250 back then, which is pretty expensive for the turn of the century. Yeah, that's a lot of money for and, back then. And so the birth of the player piano really was right there at the end of the 19th century going straight into the 20th century where, you know, you know, manufacturing here in the U.S. was, you know, at its peak. Especially in New York. And so, with, with and so you, you saw companies, um, you know, QRS and Story and Clark were the same company. 
Um, and the Story and Clark piano was one of the reproducing pianos that had the roles. Uh, but at, at a certain point, uh, going into, I want to say into the 20s, they, they bought a whole block of New York, a 100,000 square foot building, where all they were doing was manufacturing roles and recording new, new. There, I think in the mid 20s, there was a, a year where they did 11 million roles. Right. 11 million roles. Now, what, what's fascinating too is, is it's not just the, the player piano and the mechanism for it, because it, they say in there it's pneumatic, which it basically means that every single key had a rubber hose mm -hmm. that was attached to it, and it worked on suction. And when they first came out, it was mostly, you had like two accordions, pump, <laughs> that yeah. you had bellows, and like, like an old church or pump mm -hmm. organ, and that provided uh, just the basic uh, air vacuum pressure that you needed. If you pressed down more notes, it had to have a secondary source where there was air stored up so it could use up more air and then replace it, kind of like bagpipes. When mm -hmm. bagpipes have to be filled up and then you keep blowing through it, but you're using that extra air to get the lower notes or the higher notes, and in this instance, more notes. Mm -hmm. Because every time, well, we'll get around to talking about where the instructions came from, but it was fascinating because just player pianos alone wasn't enough. After a while, they started like, well, what if we put a bass drum in it? Because with this paper software, you could get not just the piano to play, you could also get it to strum a, uh, strum a banjo or um, play on a snare drum or actually hit a, hit a bass oh. drum. Xylophones were real big. They had xylophones playing inside. And then it's if you- early coding. It's, really it's very, very early coding. And, and QRS is the only remaining manufacturer today after a, a little over 125 years of manufacturing. And they still manufacture a lot of these roles. And the, the big need for these roles started around 1950 because by the time the depression hit, player pianos were out. Yeah, 29 peak, was the peak. That was the it. peak in the end. It was it was uh, it never resurfaced. Radio came along afterwards, a, a lesser form of entertainment. And uh, well, he had a, a whole generation had to go by. Then he had a vicious war, mm -hmm. and then you had the resettlement time, which is in 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 the 1950s, and so it was like, let's get great grandpa or grandma's player piano out and get some rolls. And this is what a QRS roll looked like. You would put this onto a piano, as you can see, it looks a lot like digital coding, if you looked at any. It's the Matrix, right? It's it's a, it's, this is where they got the idea for the Matrix, the This movie. is where it comes <laughs> from. This is some of the oldest software still in use on the planet today. And it's basically telling a very simple machine when to press and when to not to press. And right? when to let off. Yeah, and so it's, and to your point, you know, there, there was the, well, the Nickelodeons. Yeah, the Nickelodeons. And it would, you know, play a drum, it would play a banjo, it would all be contained in a big, upright looking piano, uh, but really, you know, it's, it's on-off functions for, for anything, and, and really well, interesting yeah, to see Yeah, and it's this. just on-off until um, there was actually, and I, I, I had his name written down, there was a German engineer, an inventor, that thought it wasn't enough to just have the piano play. You had to put some nuance into it. It should have loud and soft, and mm -hmm. it should be able to have different kind of passages in it. And that was the top of the top of the pianos that, that were played, and they were called reproducing pianos because you could control the volume. And uh, again, these weren't just big, ugly boxes. They basically these had little really switches, right? On, like, yeah, they had switches. A control. You can control the tempo, you can control the volume, and then it also had another thing in there with the, the, the wind pressure, the air pressure, mm -hmm. uh, that, that allowed it to play a little real smooth because the idea was that a player piano did not sound like a human playing it, it sounded like a machine, very automated. Mm -hmm. Again, and this is a very automated system. The reproducing system allowed uh, fluctuations and functionality where it would sound like a human was playing it. And I don't think it was that human sounding. Well, the, idea, it, the idea was there. The idea was the, there. The actual, you know, it's almost like AI today. You know, you, you think about, what it must have looked like to see a piano playing itself. Okay, now in, um, the, in the height of, of invention, especially in the Industrial Revolution, you think about what that looked like, and you know the ideas are always grander than the the, the practical use. Okay, you mentioned those 11 million rolls mm -hmm. that were manufactured. I think that was in the Ampico uh, factory. They had a no, it's a QRS. Oh, yeah, okay. they, they did 11 so million in 26. The, the other thing that's fascinating about that is that. Of those roles, and I have included, there's going to be a link with this video, mm -hmm. and it shows you how these were made. 
the process that goes there's only like a six or seven minute video and I think it was done by QRS and we'll leave that in the comments and, here. And, and it's older yeah it'll be in the comments but it's it's worth looking at because there's nothing musical about a guy punching rolls and uh, Gershwin punched some rolls and so did uh, Scott Joplin at some time but by 1930s the business was over with the rolls came back in 1950s so much so that somewhere around 1986 and this is it gets real close to where Yamaha came out with a player piano that was not pneumatic. It, it was called Player Piano, right? It was called Player Piano. Which is one of your favorite books by Kurt Vonnegut. Kurt Vonnegut. We'll, have to, we'll plug Kurt Vonnegut <laughs> here for Player Piano. But in 86, they quit focusing on these and started focusing on what they claimed were new technologies. And by 1989, which is right around the time that the disc clavier was getting heavily marketed and put out by Yamaha, uh, they had come out with the first digital reproducing system that was put into a piano that was not made as a piano like the disc clavier was. In mm -hmm. other words, they made the attachments and they put it in there. And that, that was kind of, that was the invention of the pianomation for, for QRS. That continued ever since, I guess, sometime in the late 90s, I think it was in 96, they've been publicly traded and they're still making rules to this day. They still have them and they show they, you how they make them. So they own a lot of the, the you know the original punchings of these and, and the reproducing rights, and they're able to take that and convert it digitally, and so they have one of the richest libraries. Well, it is. They have the largest, richest, oldest software libraries of piano rolls and stuff like that. However, what's really interesting is there's a different, complex process involved in taking this roll and digitizing it, and then making it play not like automated, making it play more like a human. And so there have been, the Gershwin rolls were done and treated uh, properly that way. And mm -hmm. they've taken off a of paper and put into, I believe Disclavier did that. But with QRS and their piano manufacturing, and it's uh, through Story and Clark and putting the, the, the systems in the piano, as one thing we haven't talked about on video here at the store is that we have a crew that does that now. And after years and years of having these systems, we finally have our own crew that can do in installations on any piano. Yeah, uh, and, and so that makes it nice when you have these nice, older, very aesthetically pleasing pianos that play and sound great. And people think, oh, that's a great looking piano if only it were a player. Yeah, and so technology has caught up to you know, the usability, whereas the Disc Levere and, and uh, you know, Steinway has their, uh, what is it called, the Spiro. You know, some of these manufacturers will say, hey, we make our own product that from, you know, from scratch when we're building the piano, right. we're installing the system. Uh, but there's companies, QRS is the one we're using today as an example because it's on this Kawhi behind us, but a system that can be added to any unit. So, you know, we just had someone buy an 1880 Steinway. It only has 85 keys um, and the system will be installed on there. Uh, you know, it's a couple week process, but at the end of it, you know, it's something that's very easily easy to control, um, and you don't have to buy rolls. It's it's all done on your phone now, so you have a library. Strength. Yeah, you have a library, and QRS, you know, their library is somewhere in you know plus fourteen thousand songs in their library, and you you know you're able to have that subscription. Uh, I think they give it to you for a full year, uh, but you're able to to look at their catalog, select what you want, and everything from technology that was recorded back in the early 1900s to, you know, Billy Joel, Elton John, the modern pianist, Lang Lang, I saw is doing a performance with QRS. Right. And so you're able to get these and not only, not only get the ones that have been recorded, but record your own. That, that's, that's the real thrilling thing about it. Um, player pianos is with the new technologies. It used to just be entertainment. You listen to what it does. Mm -hmm. And now with the player systems, you can sit out and make it play what you want it to play and have it play back for you. It can, it, you know, most of the systems that we sell do sell to people who are not pianist players. You know, it's it, just the reality. They, 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 want, they want a beautiful instrument. They want it to play themselves. They want it at a dinner party. It's a beautiful idea. But my favorite ones to sell are to the musician who's going to sit there and write one part with, you know, a two-handed part in the bass section and then write back on top. Right. Create their whole symphony right there for themselves. It, um, it is kind of fascinating when you take in consideration after looking at that video of how a piano roll is made and how much work was put into it. And then when you consider that now, none of that ever touches the player systems. And 
Yeah, you get 14, 15,000 songs, almost an endless supply with all the manufacturers, and they all play fluidly. They all, there, there isn't one that's better than the other. Mm -hmm. It's just a library application, and in terms of, of pricing and cost, the only thing about player systems that I can say consistent with Disclavier, with the Steinway product, the Spiro, and the QRS, is that when you add that player record mechanism, that portion to that, it, it gets really expensive because those are usually gonna be on the pro models. Yeah. And, and that is something that used to take, just for one song, everything that's involved with that video to punch a piece of paper to get it to play. And so that's kind of fascinating to think about in less than 100 years how that technology has just gone from having to have physical uh, manipulation to just airborne. And, and also the MIDI, con MIDI compatibility of it. So you're able to use your, con your, your piano as, and this is pretty much on all of them, you're able to just take the MIDI right off the board. And so when I strike this, my computer's gonna recognize that I'm striking something. I can assign functionality to it. You know, if you're really a tech person, you could like assign a different light color to every one of these. And while you're playing piano, it could be firing off different lights. And so that's not even playing the piano, that, or that's not even replaying the piano, that's just using it as a MIDI controller, which, right. I, which is you know taking advantage of the functionality. We had a couple uh, techie guys come in here that had nothing, wanted nothing to learn about playing. It, it, they just wanted a player system top of the line so they could go home and manipulate all the controls inside and just play with it as an electronic toy and use it to do all other kinds of things. Yeah, it's, it's, it's remarkable what you can do outside the sphere of just playing piano or just listening to piano, because that's you know the most common functionality that we see, again, is somebody wanting to hear piano in their home and they don't play. Um, but really, as you start uncovering the different stories, you see parents who are getting their kids' recordings right. on their instruments, you see, uh, you know, composers writing on these instruments and saving their ideas very easily, very fluidly. You see uh, recording studios take the technology right off of the piano and have MIDI controlled piano takes as well as a mic'd up piano take. And there's just, there's just a ton of technology, which is really cool. Um, again, the applications are, are incredible because it's all just right on the app store, whether you're uh, on an iPhone right. or an iPad or an Android or an Android tablet, you're able to control it very easily um, and change the, the songs. The songs that are playing change the voices if it has the recording technology or the silent comp compatibility. Um, and it's just, it's just cool where we are. And so, you know, going over what the player piano is now is very different than the idea of what, you know, your great grandmother had in her house sure. or the bar has down the street. Um, not to say that those weren't unique, beautiful things at the time. They are, and there's still an industry of people who will, will fix those and go through the parts and, and collectors even that will, that will buy these pianos. Extremely heavy, <laughs> extremely, uh, you know, temperamental with the technology because it's over right. 100 years old at this time. There is one other thing I want to mention about, um, about player pianos, and this is something that um, we should think about in terms of uh, generating, I don't know, musicians, composers. Gershwin learned how to play the piano on a player piano. By watching? By listening to the song and then pumping it a little slower and memorizing the song like a kid playing a video game. When he went and auditioned to go to music school, I believe it was Juilliard, they couldn't believe this guy could play like that and not know how to read and write music. Well, he went to school to learn how to read and write music. He could already play the piano just like a player piano because he memorized all his grandma's roles. To some extent, you know, that's what's beautiful about you know youtube and and the internet i i, I have a cousin who never really taken a lot of piano lessons plays but, really well but started there. to watch youtube videos on you know his favorite songs you know soundtracks all this stuff would watch how to play it you know the streaming lights and things like that very popular applications on youtube videos and to the same degree kind of right. filling that place of where it's educational to see something played like that in front of you and you know some of us learn differently you know like sometimes you know reading it off the off the manuscript paper is, is the way that makes that resonates with right. people. Sometimes following your ear is what resonates with people. Sometimes seeing visually someone play and hit the notes. And in this case, a recording of someone playing. And and I, I've you know it's one of the funnest things to see a kid come in and put their hands over the playing piano because they they feel all the key manipulation underneath their hands. Um, and they start, you know, it's 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 fun to see it and you see the wheels turning and they're like, wow, this is this is cool. They always make the joke, hey, is a ghost playing that piano? Well in this building they have to ask because we're we're in a almost a hundred year old you know? building. It's haunting. <laughs> um, and uh, so just yeah, player pianos Really, you know, what they have become and the purpose they serve, is it's, it's a cool place. The original Pirates of the Caribbean out in Disneyland, when mm -hmm. you went through it, they had a player piano and they put 
the, they mirrored, smoke mirrors put a ghost there playing that piano. That's ah. why a lot of people, if they ever went on the Pirates of the Caribbean tour, and they had that. HBO did their Westworld series, and the whole introduction is a player, like an old role piano player. So I actually had a customer come in and, uh, and buy a player piano because they saw Westworld. Their mind was like, whoa, I forgot about that. I wonder if they make a modern version. And of course they do. Came in and he bought a player piano. But uh, it's just, it's, it's neat. We have a lot of QRS roles. And I went through our inventory, and guess what we don't have in the store or in the warehouse? We do not have an old-fashioned player piano. A lot of those go to the dump because so they don't we work. Need, we need, <laughs> well, we need to get one and get one. But, you know, our good buddy over there at, um, at Ragtime Southwest has not just player pianos. He's got Nickelodeons and all kind of stuff. Talbot, yeah. Talbot. John's yeah. got all kind of stuff. Well, thank you guys for watching. Again, this is What Are, piano, what are Player Pianos, and specifically the QRS line we were looking at today. Uh, but if you guys have owned a player piano, if you've seen the old rolls, if you collect rolls, please leave comments. We love to interact um, and talk about the history of pianos, specifically when it's cool technology like this that, you know, at its time was, you know, the peak of, of piano playing. I mean, not the peak of it, but it, it, was, it, was, the, uh, it was rapidly becoming a form of entertainment that people enjoyed, you know, whether they were a musician, musician or not. It was, it was, right. uh, it was easily... Um, captivating to see it being played. So if you've, if you've had one, if you've played one, if you've seen one, please leave comments, leave your stories. We'd love to interact and start discussions based on player pianos. And how noisy the player system was compared to how much music you got out of the piano. Oh, yeah. it was, I mean, it was pretty close balance. It was always rivaling that. Yeah. Ted Barsalou, I'm Patrick Marr. We're here with Alamo Music Center in San Antonio, Texas. Thank you guys for watching. Check us out online, alamomusic.com. If you have any suggestions of player pianos that you want us to review, please leave comments. We'll take a look at them and, and hopefully have a cool story about it.